Today we are starting World War II. Uh, we do have three pages of notes to do today instead of the regular uh, two. We got three. Um, so uh, it shouldn't be too bad though because there's not too much writing on each one of them. All right. So starting on page two here, we're going to talk about the Second World War. Now before we start uh, in on this, I want to show you this meme uh, that I think is pretty funny. Uh, here you have uh, this one guy who says, uh, who's labeled the rest of history, and this one lady with 100 microphones in her face uh, labeled World War II. And of course, that means that World War II gets a lot of attention uh, from people, whereas the rest of history sometimes gets ignored. Um, every year, you have two or three World War II movies coming out in the theaters. Uh, if you look on the documentary section of, of Netflix, at least a third of them are all about World War II or Hitler or uh, the Nazis. Okay, so it's something that people are very, very interested in. Uh, so the big question here is why? Uh, why are people so interested in World War II? Why does it get so much love? Why does it get so much uh, attention from people who don't even necessarily love history? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. Number one, it was the bloodiest war of all time. Uh, the biggest war in the entire history of humanity. Uh, an estimated 70 million people died in total in the six years of this war, right? So just the sheer scale of World War II is one thing that entices a lot of people to it, makes it intrinsically interesting to us. It also just has some really cool characters. It has really fascinating characters, both on the good side and the bad side. People like Hitler and Churchill and Patton. Uh, you could go on and on about these people. Just very interesting uh, personalities and character studies uh, that makes it you know, seem more accessible to us. Also, it happened relatively recently. Now, you might not think that 75 years ago is all that recent. And I, I mean, I certainly wasn't alive then. Um, but compared to thousands of years ago, uh, when a lot of history that we talk about happened, 75 years ago really isn't all that long. And to think that that recently ago um, happened the, the greatest war of all time, the, the biggest war of all time, it, it's pretty uh, insane to think about it like that. Also, it was ended by the dropping of the atomic bomb. Uh, so a lot of wars kind of end anticlimactically. Uh, the dropping of the atomic bomb is the definition of a dramatic climax. Um, so that, that is one thing that kind of draws people uh, to this war. Also, America really em emerged from this war as the hero. This is when America became uh, the world's largest superpower. So for Americans, at least, this is one big reason why uh, World War II is a big part of our historical consciousness. And also in World War II, we just see the extremes. Uh, a lot of times in war, things are very nuanced, kind of gray area. People are like partially good, partially bad. But in World War II, we really see humanity at its best uh, in, in people like uh, the, the soldiers on the side of the Allies, people like Eisenhower and Churchill. Uh, but you also see humanity at its worst with people like Hitler and Stalin, right? So those extremes, the scale of it, the type of characters, the dramatic events, and the fact that it happened relatively recently, all those things really combine to make World War II incredibly interesting uh, to most people. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the rise of dictatorships in the late 1930s, something that really led to the Second World War, right? So throughout the 1920s and 1930s, there were a lot of countries that started to embrace dictatorships, all right? And the word dictator, it means uh, a type of government in which one person has sole power, has complete power over the entire country. And three countries that embraced uh, dictatorships in the 1920s and 30s are Germany, uh, Italy and Japan, and these eventually became known as the Axis powers. Now, there are three characteristics of what we call totalitarianism. That's an important word. Go ahead and circle it. An important vocab word you do need to know. Totalitarianism, all right? Uh, so the root of that word would be total, and then tarian, like authoritarian. So you have one person with total authority, all right? So that's where we get the word totalitarianism. There's a lot of different types of totalitarianism. You have communism, you have fascism. Uh, you could even consider monarchy or theocracy to be totalitarianism as well. And there are really three characteristics that makes a society totalitarian. First, you have one leader that has absolute or complete control of the nation. And you also have really no civil or political rights for the citizens. Okay? That one leader becomes a tyrant and oppresses the people by taking away all of their civil and political rights. And then you also typically have military and territorial expansion. Okay? Now you can have one of these three things and it not necessarily be a totalitarian society, but when you have all three, it very much is. So by the 1920s, the Japanese government was under the control of the military. They had completely taken over 
the country of Japan. And in 1931, Japan invaded the Chinese province of Manchuria. So on this map here, uh, the island in the red, of course, right here is Japan. Okay, they had invaded uh, the peninsula of Korea, and then they invaded the Chinese province of Manchuria. So they had invaded China, took an, taken over a part of China. And so some historians say 1931, that's really when World War II started, uh, because that was the first act of severe aggression by one of the Axis powers. And a big reason why Japan wanted to take over Manchuria is because of all the natural resources and raw materials you find in that region of China. So if you look at Japan, very small land mass here, large population, but very small land mass. So you don't have many natural resources there. And that's one big reason why they expanded uh, through the use of their military. Okay, so that's Japan and their rise of dictatorships. And in 1922, um, Italy, okay, so a little bit before Japan embraced dictatorship, um, Italy uh, fell to uh, fascism and Benito Mussolini. So Benito Mussolini took over Italy, uh, began a series of repressive tactics in order to become a dictator. And in October of 1935, Italy attacked the nation of Ethiopia. All right, so if you remember from the last time we talked about Africa, uh, with the colonization of Africa, carving it up with all these European powers, uh, Ethiopia, that country in the orange in the map there, was one of two countries on the entire continent of Africa that was not taken over by European countries. Um, Benito Mussolini said, well then, here's my opportunity, I am going to take it over. All right, so Ethiopia was taken over by Italy. As, as you know, military and territorial uh, expansion is one of the hallmarks of totalitarianism. And then we come to Germany, and the uh, political party of Adolf Hitler was called the National Socialist Party, the National Socialist Party, better known as the Nazi Party. And there were a lot of reasons why Germany um, was desperate enough to embrace a leader like Hitler, a lot of which we have already talked about. You have inflation uh, going on, that hyperinflation from them printing so much money and having to pay so many billions of dollars to the Allies. Also rebuilding after the destruction of World War I. You had millions of Germans uh, killed in World War I, and a lot of their territory was, was destroyed as well. And these severe economic, uh, economic problems that were caused by the war uh, led people to embrace this radical leader. So in 1923, um, Hitler made a speech uh, called the Beer Hall Push, uh, where he makes a speech at a beer hall, which is like a bar, and he attempts to take over the government by rallying people to his side and kind of marching on uh, the government's military. And this was Hitler's first attempt to seize power. Now, this did not work. Um, he was arrested. A lot of his comrades were, were killed and he was arrested for treason, for trying to take over the government. But he didn't stop there. Uh, he still tried to uh, make his philosophy work and uh, take control of Germany. So while he was in prison uh, for uh, what he did at the Beer Hall Push in uh, 1923, he wrote a book called Mein Kampf, which means my struggle in German. And in this book, it's basically his autobiography. He's talking about his philosophy of life, what he believes uh, needs to happen with the German people, um, how, in his opinion, they're superior and need to take over all of Europe and eradicate what he called the inferior races, all right? So even though he's in, in jail, he's still very much dangerous, uh, still very much radical and, and wanting to take over the government. So over the next several years, once he got out of jail, uh, he built a coalition of more and more people who uh, nodded along with his philosophy because he was such an impressive public speaker. He was a very skilled public speaker, and because of that, he was able to convince people of things that were wrong. Uh, so uh, Hitler became the chancellor of Germany, which is kind of like the president of Germany, on January 30th, 1933. All right, so in 10 years, he went from being imprisoned for treason to now being the chancellor of Germany. And the name that Hitler gave his new government was the Third Reich, which means the third realm, the third uh, wave, the third phase uh, that the German people uh, go through in their history. He said this is the, the final Reich, the, the final realm uh, that the Aryans uh, ha have now uh, succeeded in accomplishing. So in 1935, when Hitler was gaining more and more power as chancellor of Germany and consolidating more power for himself, 
he began a secret buildup of Germany's military. You have to ask the question, why did it have to be secret? Well, remember, the Treaty of Versailles said what? It said that Germany had to reduce the size of its military, and it did. And Germany was not allowed to build up its military anymore. So in 1935, Hitler began to do that in secret because it was violating the Treaty of Versailles. Then came his Nuremberg Laws. So in addition to building up uh, the military, Hitler began to set very restrictive laws against against German Jews. Okay, so we took away their freedom of speech, uh, property restrictions, job restrictions. Okay, all of these uh, rights, you know, civil and political rights that began to be taken away from Jews. Okay, and this is something that's very important to understand. Hitler did not immediately, once he rose to power, he didn't immediately say, "Hey, let's kill all the Jews." If he had said that, most people wouldn't have gone along with him. But there's an analogy of putting a frog in boiling water. Uh, since frogs are cold-blooded, um, if you put a frog in a regular pot of water and then very, very slowly heat it up, the frog will not realize that the water is getting hotter and he will boil to death without even realizing that he could jump out of uh, the pot. But if you just dump a frog into a boiling pot of water, he's going to jump out. So the analogy connects by saying, um, if you want to make people believe a lie or do something bad like this, you, slow, you start slowly with little things like property restrictions, job restrictions, taking away freedom of speech. Then you slowly amp it up to, oh, maybe these people um, should have to wear uh, l little armbands with the Star of David on it. Uh, and then you amp it up a little bit saying, oh, they need to be um, isolated to their own little communities. And then you amp it up to now concentration camps. So he didn't do it all at once. He did it very slowly. And that's one reason why Germans were able to have the wool pulled over their eyes uh, and, and just blindly accepted what he did because it happened so gradually. So Hitler's uh, master race, okay, what he considered to be the master race was the Aryan race, okay, basically pure German ancestry. If you look at the picture right here, this is an example of an Aryan. So uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, white skin, um, German ancestry, all right, that, that's what's considered to be an Aryan. And Hitler saw those types of people to be the best race, the superior race, all right? Um, so this belief is what caused him to, um, to set uh, restrictive laws against Jews and persecute Jews and, and think that he had the right to take over other lands. So in March of 1936, Hitler took over the Rhineland. Okay, the Rhineland is the area in the light green on that map right there. And that's a part of Germany that was taken away from them with the Treaty of Versailles. So whenever Hitler took that land back over and the Allies really didn't do anything, that was basically him saying, I no longer respect the Treaty of Versailles. We're no longer going to abide by it. Um, that type of armistice is over. Now, Jesse Owens, we've uh, mentioned him briefly, but now that we know a little bit about Hitler, let's, let's review about Jesse Owens. Um, he was a black man, and he won four gold medals during Hitler's Olympics, okay, at the 1936 Summer Olympics in Berlin, hosted by Adolf Hitler. He won four gold medals and defeated a lot of Aryans. So if you look at that uh, picture right there, um, you have Hitler's Aryan athlete on the right there, and then you have Jesse Owens, who won the gold at the top, saluting the American flag. So as a teenager, Hitler dropped out of high school and moved to Vienna, Austria, in order to become an artist. But he was rejected from art school in Vienna. Here are some of his uh, paintings. Here's one uh, that he did here of, of a building. He oftentimes did buildings or landscapes. He could never really master uh, painting people. Uh, but if you look at these paintings, it's really not that bad. I mean, certainly better uh, than I could do. Uh, but he was rejected from art school, so he said, ah, eh, I'll just become a mass murderer instead. Uh, basically kind of the jump he made there. All right, now when World War I started, okay, another little bit of review here before we get into the meat of World War II. Uh, remember, uh, Hitler in World War I tried to enlist with the Austrian army, but was denied because of his lack of physical strength. They determined he was not strong enough to carry a rifle. Uh, so he uh, joined the German army and fought in the trenches there. He was temporarily blinded uh, by poison gas during one uh, bombing attack. And Hitler really found belonging in the structure of the army. He loved fighting for Germany, really fell in love with the military. Uh, and at one point, if you remember from the video, an Allied soldier actually had Adolf Hitler in his sights and chose not to pull the trigger. Uh, kind of one of those moments where you say you had one job to do. Uh, if only he had uh, pulled the trigger, history would have been much, much different. 
All right, so now let's get into how the war began in Europe. Now that we've talked about the rise of dictatorships and how they rose to power, how did the war itself start? Well, Adolf Hitler, you have to understand his goal, his mindset, his ambition was to take over the entire world. Now, that just sounds silly coming out of your mouth, saying someone wants to take over the entire world. When I think of that, I think of like a Saturday morning cartoon show where you have the cartoon villain says, oh, I want to take over the world. Uh, but that's literally what Hitler was like. That was his goal. So the place he first invaded, as you learned on the last page, was the Rhineland. This was an area on the border of Germany and France uh, that had been taken away from Germany in the Treaty of Versailles. So the Allies responded to this with what's called the policy of appeasement. So to appease someone uh, means to basically give them what they want, okay? to pacify them uh, in order to try to make peace, hoping that they will stop there. It allowed Hitler to take over countries as long as he promised, Pinky promised, not to do so again. But this did not work because Hitler could not be satisfied. Uh, since he wanted global domination, he literally could not be satisfied with certain chunks of land. And that's one thing the Allies did not understand. Now, if the Allies had stopped him with military force when he first tried to take over land in uh, the 1930s when he took over the Rhineland, uh, it's possible that World War II never would have escalated to the point that it had. Uh, but because the Allies kept saying, okay, I guess you can take over the Rhineland, I guess you can take over this area, this area, just stop there, okay, promise you'll never do it again, Hitler. Um, it's because of that um, that Hitler was emboldened to continue to try to take over more and more and more land, you know, just becoming, becoming more ravenous for land uh, the more he was given. So this policy continued even after uh, Hitler and Germany took over the Rhineland. Uh, the next step was Hitler to take over Austria. Okay, so here's Germany. Rhineland was the first area he took over right here on the border of Germany and France. And then he took over Austria. He did this by creating what he called the Anschluss, basically saying, oh, well, Austria is kind of a part of Germany. A lot of the people there speak German. We should just make it a part of Germany. Uh, no big deal. And, and that's part of our empire now. Is that okay, allies? And the allies were like, uh, okay, I guess. But that's it, Hitler. That's all we can agree to. And Hitler said, fine, I promise no more. And a few months later, uh, he took over the Sudetenland, which is the area here in the white, which is the area of Czechoslovakia, that was more than 50% German speaking. And after that, uh, Neville Chamberlain, the uh, uh, leader, the, the prime minister of uh, Great Britain, he met with Hitler and he said, now I'll tell you what, Hitler, I'll let you have this once. It's all I can agree to, but that is all. No more land for you. Got to stop here. And Hitler said, yes, I, I promise. But then, of course, he wasn't uh, satisfied. Hitler then split land uh, with the USSR at the Munich conference. He kept taking more and more and more land, and Allied leaders like Britain's Neville Chamberlain did nothing about it because they were so scared of Hitler and so scared of another war breaking out uh, that they did not want uh, to make him mad. But instead, they just made him more hungry for more land by doing nothing about it. So eventually, Germany doubled in size to all this area you see on the map in red. So Hitler gained all of this territory without having to fire a single bullet. He completely uh, just talked his way into all of this land, and the Allies just shrugged it off and said, okay, I guess that's fine. Uh, just be careful. Don't take over any more land. But of course, he took more land. Uh, so even though the Nazis hadn't fired a single shot, Hitler's actions were in direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles, because the Treaty of Versailles said this land is no longer going to be Germany, Germany can no longer have a large military, and Hitler was basically tearing up this treaty and saying, we're not going to abide by this anymore. So the more territory he got, the more he would want, all right? And the Allies were really doing nothing, which encouraged him to eventually take over countries violently. He said, hey, if I can take over this much territory without firing a single shot, how, how much can I take over uh, with my military? How much can I take over violently? I mean, there, there's no limits, really. Um, so Hitler eventually decided to do this, and he made an agreement with Joseph Stalin in order to do it. All right, so the, the, the Second World War officially started on September 1st, 1939, okay? And that is when Hitler violently invaded Poland and took it over with the help of the Soviet Union. So Stalin and Hitler were on the same team. They were on the same side at the beginning of World War II. That's going to change a little bit later, but for now, that is how it is. 
Okay, so with the help of the Soviet Union, Hitler took over Poland, and that was the beginning of World War II. He then went on to invade France, which took him about six weeks, and he conquered France. Uh, then he took over Belgium, took over the Netherlands, Denmark, Norway. All right, so pretty much half of Europe he completely uh, took over in just a few short months, uh, resulting in over one million deaths in that time period. Okay, so look at this map right here. All that area in gray was taken over by Hitler by May of 1940. Just so much territory. Some he just talked his way into, and the rest he took over by force. All right, so you see what the policy of appeasement got us. They got us a second world war. Now, Hitler's relationship to Joseph Stalin, the dictator of the Soviet Union, uh, was basically they hated each other, uh, but they signed an agreement to become allies in order to avoid having to face the other one in battle. Okay, so they they hate each other, but at the same time, um, they are scared of each other. Okay, because they're both so evil and and they're both so similar that they know how the other one would fight, and that would be ruthlessly. Uh, one historian compared Stalin and Hitler to a tarantula and a scorpion in a bottle fighting over the corpses of their own troops because they didn't care how many of their own troops had to die as long as they defeated the other one. Okay, So at first, remember, they signed this, um, this agreement to be on the same side, but then Hitler said, you know what? I've taken over all this area. I don't really need Russia's help anymore. In fact, I want Russia. Uh, so in the summer of 1941, Hitler broke his pact with Stalin and invaded Russia. Okay, so this would later on prove to be a mistake uh, because just like we learned from Napoleon, it's very difficult to invade Russia, especially uh, when winter is coming soon. Now, shifting to Great Britain at this time, uh, Winston Churchill had just been elected the prime minister of the UK, and he rejected this policy of appeasement. He said, my predecessor, Neville Chamberlain, was a fool. He should not have uh, been tricked by Hitler like this. Uh, we should not appease him whatsoever. Uh, so when Hitler was taking over all this territory, Churchill said, if he tries to take over England, if he even suggests that, we will fight. Okay? We are not going to give in. We are not going to compromise with him or give him anything he wants. We are going to fight him and defeat the Nazis. So he vowed to never surrender. So while Hitler was a very good public speaker, Churchill was an excellent public speaker as well. He was also able to rally people around his cause. Now, while the war was raging in Europe, the United States wanted to stay out of it. Okay, just like with World War I, we wanted to stay out of these crazy Europeans' wars. We don't really have anything to gain, just millions of lives to lose, and so we did not want to get involved. So in an attempt to avoid a repetition of the events that led up to our involvement in World War I, the U.S. Congress passed a series of neutrality acts in the mid-1930s. And all this did was eventually get us involved in World War II, just like we got involved in World War I. So this action by the U.S. Congress illustrates the policy of isolationism. We wanted to remain isolated apart from Europe. Uh, we wanted to kind of desperately cling to the Monroe Doctrine uh, for the last few years before it was finally absolved, uh, dissolved. Now, one other purpose these neutrality acts served was to provide war materials for other democratic nations, known as the Allies. All right. So while we didn't want to get involved with the war uh, because we didn't want to risk our own lives, uh, we still wanted to support who we believed to be the good guys, right? So we gave materials, gave war materials like tanks and things to uh, the allies like Britain. So in order to avoid active participation in the European war, there were three acts in particular that you need to know about. The first was called the Lend-Lease Act, basically saying we will lend certain items to the allies, we'll lease certain items to the allies, uh, and, and basically give them loans, and they can pay us back after the war. Then comes the Cash Carry Act, which basically says we will give cash to the Allies so they can help out, so we can help out in some way. And then the, the Destroyer Deal said we will give uh, destroyers and other types of battleships and, and naval uh, ships to, uh, to the Allies to help them fight Hitler. However, even though most Americans did not want to enter the war, all of these foreign policy actions showed that little by little, the U.S. was becoming increasingly drawn into the war in Europe, to the point that our joining the war officially was just a matter of time. It was only a matter of time and, and what event was going to cause us to officially join this war. All right. Now, has anyone ever seen this 
uh, this poster before. You've probably seen something like it or a parody like it. There's a, a lot of uh, these these types of posters that kind of get changed a little bit to uh, make like a meme or, or uh, some some uh, bit of humor. But the original uh, poster said, keep calm and carry on. And that was in uh, Britain in 1940 when Hitler was attacking. These were all over the place to encourage people to, as it said, keep calm, uh, keep your wits about you. We, we will get through this, all right? And the reason why uh, they needed so much encouragement is because here's a picture of London, okay, of, of what London looked like during Hitler's attack on London, okay? So in the fall of 1940, Hitler turned toward Great Britain. That was the next country he wanted to take over. He'd already taken over 10 other countries, and he said, the next one on my checklist is Britain. Okay, so what he did was he bombed the city of London every single night for two months straight. Without rest, every single night, uh, his Luftwaffe, his, his uh, air force, would fly over the city of London and drop bombs on, uh, on the city. Okay, and you have millions of people dying because of this. A lot of people left London or had to live in the, uh, in the, in the uh, subway stations uh, underground, okay, the underground train stations. A lot of people had to, to, to flee the city, especially a lot of children. Uh, in fact, if you've ever read or seen uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, the very beginning scene shows the bombing of London, and that's why the, the children have to move to the country where they find the wardrobe. Now, all of this bombing led to the Battle of Britain, and this is when England's Royal Air Force defeated the Nazis and pushed them back. So this was Hitler's first defeat. So because Churchill and the British refused to back down to Hitler, refused to surrender, uh, they were able to push the Nazis back and show people that Hitler is not invincible, that he's not unbeatable, all right, that he can be defeated if you are determined to defeat him, all right? So with the Royal Air Force with um, Britain's effort here, they were able to push back the Nazis. All right, so that's the beginning of the war in Europe. We'll pick up on that point uh, next class. Now let's turn to the war in Japan because this truly was a world war. It did not just occur in Europe. It also occurred in the Pacific and our major enemy was Japan. All right, so just to show you how evil the Japanese were, uh, I want to talk about the Rape of Nanking. It's also known as the Nanking Massacre. And this occurred in 1937. Uh, Japanese soldiers invaded the Chinese capital of Nanking, and they committed mass murder, mass rape against the city's Chinese civilians. An estimated 300,000 people were slaughtered uh, by the Japanese simply because they were Chinese. Okay, now, this was one of the biggest crimes against humanity of the past uh, several centuries. Uh, and this is why Japan became an enemy of the U.S. and of decent nations even before the war began. We had our eye on them because they were committing such atrocities. All right, so one big reason why I bring this up is because a lot of times when we think about uh, World War II, we just see the Nazis as the bad guys. And certainly the Nazis were the bad guys, but they were not the only bad guys, all right? The Japanese were equally evil uh, to the Nazis. They committed atrocities. Uh, just as bad as as the Holocaust, okay, and and, and uh, deserve to be reviled just as much as the Nazi Party, okay. So that's who we're dealing with here. And so when you uh, hear about um, America's actions against the Japanese to fight back against them, uh, keep this in mind about what the Japanese were doing and what they were capable of. So the Empire of Japan in the late 1930s and early 1940s, in addition to these violent massacres they were carrying out. Uh, they were also just taking over Asia, one country at a time. They had the goal of taking over all of Asia, uh, and they were taking over many islands and countries by force. If you look on that map there, by 1941, that was the Empire of Japan. All that area in the red was controlled by the Japanese. They had taken over all of that territory, North and South Korea, half of China, um, all of uh, what we now know as Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar, Indonesia, uh, Taiwan, the Philippines, tons of islands in the Pacific. All that territory was violently conquered by uh, the Japanese. So Emperor Hirohito, who you see in that picture there um, on the backdrop of uh, the rising sun flag of the Empire of Japan, he was uh, in charge of the country and his minister of war, his name was Hideki Tojo. All right, so those are the two names you need to know. Those were the leaders of Japan, uh, Emperor Hirohito and the minister of war, Hideki Tojo. And they also made an alliance with Adolf Hitler 
and Benito, Benito Mussolini. And this created the Axis powers uh, against what we know of as the Allies. So the U.S. saw all this going on. We said we have to put a stop to this somehow. Remember, FDR is still president at this time. So in order to try to put a stop to Japanese violent conquest of Asia and the Pacific, um, FDR put in place an oil embargo on Japan uh, because Japan was entirely uh, dependent on American oil. Remember, they didn't have many natural resources, and they were entirely dependent on American oil. So FDR said, we're not going to give them any more oil, so he put in place an embargo, which means we're not going to send any more to them. And this stopped all oil exports to Japan. And if you stop their oil, you stop their war machine. All right, so Japan was furious about this because they wanted to continue their conquest and they couldn't without American oil. So in order to kind of make America pay for this oil embargo, they uh, attacked Pearl Harbor. Okay, most of you guys probably know about Pearl Harbor. This is what officially got America into the war. Uh, it took place on December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, as what FDR said, a date every American should know. And on this date, this Sunday morning, they carried out a surprise attack on the U.S. Navy's fleet, the Pacific Fleet, located on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. So we had most of our Pacific Fleet, most of our battleships and carriers and destroyers all lined up together, and we had no idea that the Japanese uh, were even were, were even uh, wanting uh, to bomb us, okay, wanting to attack us in any way. But of course, we were wrong. We were caught completely by surprise, and about 3,000 Americans were killed on this terrible day. Okay, the official number is 2,403 Americans were killed, 1,173 were wounded, and most of the U.S. Pacific Fleet was destroyed. So we couldn't fight back right away. It took a little while to rebuild up our Pacific Fleet so that we could fight back against the Japanese. But the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor really illustrates the impact that one single event can have on public opinion during a time of crisis. Before uh, Pearl Harbor, most Americans did not want to get involved in World War II. We wanted to stay isolationist, Monroe Doctrine. Uh, we didn't want to get involved in this crazy war with the Europeans. But now, now that the Japanese have attacked America and killed thousands of us, now it's our problem. Now we want to get involved and show the Japanese, uh, teach the Japanese a lesson, and also teach Hitler a lesson, because he's about to declare war on us too. Okay, so before Pearl Harbor, most Americans did not want to get involved. After Pearl Harbor, most Americans were not only willing to get involved, but eager to go to war. Okay, you have uh, tens of thousands of American men lining up uh, to enlist for the military that very day, uh, because they were so furious and, and we were so emboldened and en enraged uh, by what the Japanese had done to us. So the U.S. Uh, becoming involved in World War II, this happened primarily because of aggressive military actions by Germany and Japan in Europe and Asia, okay, specifically uh, culminating in Pearl Harbor. Okay, That's how we justified getting into World War II, main reason why we got involved. Now, at the beginning of World War II, Hitler wanted to keep America out of the war because he knew his history. He knew that in World War I, uh, one of the big reasons why Germany uh, was defeated is because America got involved and beat them. All right, but after Pearl Harbor, Hitler changed his mind. He said, ooh, this is my chance to strike America now. They're weak. Uh, I'm strong, he said. Almost everyone has, has been defeated by me. Uh, so he changed his mind. Now he wanted America in the war. He wanted to defeat the United States. So on December 11th, 1941, just four days after Pearl Harbor, Hitler declared war on the United States. So now not only are we at war with Japan, which we declared war on them just one day after Pearl Harbor, we are now also at war with Germany. So now for the first time ever in U.S. history, we are experiencing a two-front war. Okay, So that means two wars at the same time. And fighting a two-front war is a huge challenge that we've never had to face before. Uh, it means that only half of your supplies and people can be focused on each front. Uh, so half of our supplies were sent to Europe, Half were sent to the Pacific to fight both Germany and Japan at the same time. Oh, yeah, and we also fought in North Africa, all right, because remember, Italy was a part of the Axis powers as well, so we were fighting them too, all right, and we started to fight them in North Africa, then invaded Italy, okay, so really, we're fighting on many different fronts all throughout the world. 
Now, you probably re re remember uh, the name Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur. He was the World War I hero we uh, saw in the video, and he chose uh, he was chosen by FDR to lead the U.S. troops in the Pacific because he was such a war hero, such a smart guy, and knew his stuff. Now, the strategy that MacArthur employed in the Pacific was called island hopping. Island hopping. Now, this meant fighting on one Pacific island after another with the goal of eventually getting close enough to the Japanese mainland, the island of Japan, uh, that uh, we would eventually be able to invade Japan. All right. So if you look at this map here, look, look, we're just going from one island to the next, one island to the next, fighting a battle there, fight them there, fight them here, fight them there. Okay, go to Guam, all right, go to Saipan, all right, Guadalcanal, Coral Sea, all right, just one after another, fighting the Japanese there, fighting them off that island, and then eventually, uh, hopefully, getting to the island of Japan. Okay, now one huge challenge in fighting the Japanese that we didn't really have to worry about when fighting Europeans is the view that the Japanese had on human life. They did not value human life at all as you are going to see um, next class when we talk about the kamikaze pilots who are suicide bombers. Uh, but also, they did not care about every single one of them dying in a battle. All right, so whenever you fight a, uh, an enemy that literally will not surrender, that will fight to the very last man, even if, even if it's just one of them left and a thousand of you left, that they will keep fighting, it's very difficult to defeat an enemy like that. And you're going to have a lot of your own people killed. Okay, so that was a huge challenge in fighting the Japanese in the Pacific. So in order to summarize these events here, okay, to summarize the events leading to America's involvement in World War II, first the U.S. passed neutrality acts, okay, then came uh, things like the Lend-Lease Act, which gradually drew us into the war, and then on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, then the very next day, the U.S. declared war on Japan. Okay, so those are the series of events that led to us becoming involved. Okay, so the last thing here uh, for today, uh, one thing to know about, we'll talk a little bit more about next time, is on March 18th, 1942, FDR signed an executive order to arrest all Japanese American citizens and move them to internment camps, all right? So because of uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, there was a lot of prejudice against Japanese Americans, even though most Japanese Americans had nothing to do with Pearl Harbor and weren't even loyal to Japan at all since they were Americans. Uh, but basically, uh, FDR said they're a national security threat. We need to put them in uh, these prisons known as internment camps, uh, relocation centers, he called them as well, uh, because he saw them as a national security threat. Okay, But one major cause uh, for this action was racial prejudice. Proof of that is there were no internment camp for German Americans or Italian Americans, even though we were at war with them too. Okay, uh, So quick distinction here, um, internment camps are not concentration camps. All right, So no Japanese American citizens were killed or starved or tortured at these camps, but they were prison camps, all right? They, they were prisons, they, they were held there against their will, so definitely not a good thing, all right? But sometimes war makes people do crazy things like that. All right, let me know if you have any questions or if I can better explain anything we just talked about.